So we are going to be in Mark again today, chapter 10. And I'm sure everybody can hear fine. So, all right. So the title of today's sermon, which will be from chapter 10, verses 20, I have that wrong. It's going to be verses 32 through 45 this morning. We will go through. And the title of today's sermon is Without Hesitation. Without Hesitation. So let us just open up in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word, for the Bible, for your scripture that you have spoken to us, that you've breathed to us. We're very thankful, Lord God, that you have given us this word. We pray today that your Holy Spirit would make this word real to us, that your Holy Spirit would reveal the truth of what we are supposed to hear today. I ask, Father, that your Spirit would help me to preach this word in a manner which glorifies your name and that shares the truth of what is before us this morning. And we ask for your grace that you would help us to hear and then help us apply that which we hear today to our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're at in the Gospel of Mark, because we've been in the Gospel of Mark for 43 weeks. This is our 44th week wow. in this Gospel. And we are now at the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life. About half of Mark, just, you know, 60% of Mark's Gospel, maybe 40%, is all dealing with the last seven days of Jesus' life. And we're just about to approach that last week in Jesus' life. So Jesus' crucifixion at this point is almost just about a week away, just slightly maybe over a week away. I was thinking about this, who knows, maybe around Easter time, we will actually be at the resurrection if we keep at a decent pace going through the Gospel of Mark. But... Some of you know that at times I can drag things out a bit, a bit, so it may not be Easter 2014, but <laughs> Easter 2015 by the time we get to actually the resurrection. Okay, I can draw things out. Today we're going to see something else, though. On the other hand, even though I can draw things out, Jesus does not hesitate at all in today's passage. He is making his way towards Jerusalem without any hesitation. So I might delay things, but Jesus is not delaying today, you will see. Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem, and he is walking very rapidly towards his death. Now Jesus taught, we all know that, he taught a lot of things. We've been listening to him teach us all these last weeks. But Jesus was not born to teach. And Jesus healed people. And he still heals people today. But Jesus was not born to heal. Jesus was born for one purpose, and that one purpose was to die. Jesus was born to die. Now Jesus, when we think of Jesus, Jesus always was. And Jesus is today, and Jesus always will be the eternal Son of God. That's something we have to comprehend. Jesus has always existed as the Son of God. There is God the Father, who is Spirit. There is God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is Spirit. And there is God the Son, who is Spirit. But something happened. There was the incarnation where God the Son, the Spirit, became man. He put on flesh, human flesh. God the Son forever took on the flesh of man. God the Son died as a man, and he became the first of those to be physically resurrected as men. It's quite an amazing thing. I stand here with a wrist 
that I hurt yesterday, and a back that's hurting. Leon's got a back that's hurting. Other people are. Why would, why would Jesus even want this flesh? This flesh sucks at times, folks. It's just really, it's a pain at times. But yet, Jesus loved us so much that he became man. And he today still has a physical body. He is fully God, and he is at the very same time fully man forever. You know what? We cannot and may never be able to wrap our minds around what happened when God the Son became man. But what we can know is this, that even if we don't understand it, it is true. Our understanding of something does not negate or prove the truth of a matter. I, I bring all this up because as we move through our text this morning, I really want us to keep that in mind, that Jesus, who is Jesus? As, as we go through this, and as Jesus talks about what is about to happen to him, let us keep in mind and let us remember that Jesus is both man and the creator of man. Both man and God. So Mark chapter 10, verse 32. The scripture says that they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, so the disciples, and they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. Right away in our passage, we're told a few things. Number one, they were going up to Jerusalem. Number two, Jesus is walking in the lead. Number three, that the followers of Jesus were fearful and amazed. So we've got this picture. They're walking up the road to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up on a mountain. So they're walking up the side of that mountain to the city of Jerusalem. And as they're going up, Jesus is the one that is leading the way. And those who are following <laughs> Jesus are afraid. They're full of fear. And they are at the same time full of amazement. Now, what were they afraid of? What did they fear? That's a good question. Now, to understand what's going on in the time that what's going on chronologically, somewhere right around this time of Mark's events, Jesus had just returned to the area of Judea where Jerusalem is. He had been north of that area, and right around this time, John's Gospel tells us that Jesus had come to this region. Why? Why did Jesus come to this region? Because his friend Lazarus had died. And John tells us that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was dead, Jesus said to his disciples in John eleven seven, he says this, let us go to Judea again. See, they haven't been to Judea in a while. And then the disciples said to him, but Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going to go there again? And Jesus says to them, no, let us go to Lazarus. And upon that, Jesus' insistence that he had to go again to Judea, to Jerusalem, as, as he's insisting that Thomas, the doubter, in this case is not doubting at all, Thomas says to the other disciples, he says, let us go also, that we may die with him. Wow. The disciples were afraid as they were walking up that road to Jerusalem. They were afraid for the life of Jesus because they knew he was going to die there. And they were afraid for their own lives because they had said, let us go and die with him. That's why they were fearful. In Mark's gospel, in the earlier chapters, we're up to chapter 10 now, in chapters 8 and 9, before all of this, Jesus has repeatedly spoken 
about the suffering and the death that he was about to endure when he went to Jerusalem next. And as we just saw in John's Gospel, the disciples were planning on being killed with him. And of course, they were afraid. I don't want anybody in this room to tell me that you wouldn't be afraid in that circumstance, knowing that you were walking to possibly your sure death, and you knew that Jesus was. And at the same time, it was their fear that actually caused them to be amazed. Because it said they were amazed and fearful. It's their fear that caused them to be amazed. They were amazed that after telling them repeatedly he was going to suffer and be killed when he went to Jerusalem, they were amazed that Jesus was leading the pack, that he was out ahead. They were amazed by Jesus' determination to go to Jerusalem, to suffer and to die. That was what was amazing them. They knew it was coming, and they were amazed by it. Jesus is marching forward while his disciples are more, you know, are assuredly lagging behind. They may be hesitating as they move towards Jerusalem, but Jesus, in Jesus, there is no hesitation as he moves towards his death. None whatsoever. I can just picture Jesus going up the hill. Come on, you slow pokes, come on. It's going to be great. Why are you dragging your feet? Pick up the pace, guys. I have an appointment to suffer and to die. It's probably at their reluctance to follow Jesus to Jerusalem that Jesus says, okay, let's stop for a moment. Let's talk about all this again. And that's where verse 32 comes in. And again, notice again, Jesus has been repeatedly telling his disciples for three chapters so far. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, and spit on him, and scourge him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. I mean, Jesus knows what is coming. And without hesitation, he is walking towards it. Before time, God declared that this day was going to come where Jesus went to Jerusalem to die. God had declared that before time, and it was going to happen. It was going to come. Nothing was going to stop it in Jesus' mind. Nothing. You know, verse 33, if we notice there, that Jesus said that he would be delivered over. In fact, twice in that passage, we see Jesus being handed over, being delivered over to those who would hurt him. Jesus is aware of all this, and it's going to happen. Jesus is going to be first handed over to the Jews, and then he is going to be handed over to the Gentiles by the Jews. Both Jew and Gentile have a hand in the death of Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing is, both Jew and Gentile are saved through that sacrifice that Jesus makes when he enters Jerusalem. I mean, it wasn't long ago that we heard the disciples arguing amongst themselves, and their argument was all around this thought, which of us is the greatest? And in just a minute, we will hear two disciples, James and John, in just a moment, ask for some special treatment from Jesus. Because these men want to glorify themselves. So we know that Jesus is in the midst of a bunch of guys who are very selfish and self-glorifying in their attitude. They want to be known as the greatest. They want to sit in the special place of honor we'll see in a moment. And it is even in the midst of this the self-glorifying, self-righteous individuals that Jesus says, let's go to Jerusalem that I might die even for the sakes of you, for Gentile, 
from you. Jesus knows that he's going to be mocked, he's going to be spit upon, he's going to be scourged, and he's going to die at the hands of selfish men like the ones that are even in his midst. And yet he marches on. Verse 34, Jesus says, they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. He's speaking of himself. He's speaking as the Son of Man that is prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. But Jesus knows this. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be beaten. And he's going to be killed. He has no hesitation. He keeps going. I mean, let us consider that thought for a moment. The very people that Jesus created, they are going to be the ones who make fun of him and who mock him. The very people that Jesus created are the ones that are going to be allowed to spit upon him. The very people that Jesus created are going to beat him to a bloody pulp and hang him on a cross. The very people Jesus created are going to be allowed to kill him. I started thinking about that, and you know, we get all upset when someone just looks at us funny. Or when someone, you, you know, beats us to a parking space, we get all upset, or they throw snow in our driveway. I mean, in light of what Jesus has done, I mean, Jesus was mocked on our behalf for our sake. He was spit upon for our sake on our behalf. He was beaten in our place on our behalf. And he was murdered for our sake on our behalf. And knowing that all this was coming, Jesus just didn't hesitate, hesitate marching towards Jerusalem, knowing that he was going to die and that all this would happen. I mean, the, some, the next time somebody looks at me funny and I want to start you know, singing that song that God doesn't love me anymore, I'm going to remember these verses. When I'm slightly inconvenienced in one way or another, I'm going to remember that Jesus was made fun of and spit upon on my behalf, that he was scourged and killed. I'll tell you what, as I start thinking upon Jesus and the cross and all he's done for me, it won't matter what people do to me. I mean, he's taken the worst blow. Verse 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Well, the good news is, I mean, these guys are being all self-promoting and, you know, all of that. That's ugly, but the good news is, about these two guys. At least they understand the ramifications of what Jesus had just said at the end of verse 34, that three days later he would rise again. At least these two believed that after his death he would rise again. And rising again that he would sit in glory. And that he would sit upon the throne that was meant for him. And that he would rule. So at least they understood that. You know, whenever Jesus talks in any of these passages about his death and about his resurrection, you know, about his death and his suffering, he always talks about his resurrection as well. He never stops at his death. He always goes straight through to his resurrection, resurrection, because that's where the hope comes in. If Jesus had just died and it was all over there, I mean, it wouldn't be a good picture, folks. Paul says the same sort of thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 and 18. He says this, If Christ has not been raised, our faith, you and I, our faith, is worthless, and we are still in our sins if he has not been raised. For those also who have fallen asleep have perished if Christ has not been raised. For if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, in other words, if he only died and wasn't resurrected, then we are the men to be most pitied. And the resurrection is the, is the hinge pin. It's the most important part of the gospel, that he was raised for those who he died for. And the good news is that James and John understood Jesus was going to be raised from the dead, and that afterwards they too would rise with him in glory. 
That is if they place their hope in him. So it's so good that they knew this. And if you think about it, James and John were two of the three that had actually seen Jesus on the Mount of the Transfiguration. So they had actually seen Jesus already in his glory. So they knew the kind of king he was. And that was a great thing. Also, before this, in Matthew's account, we didn't read it in Mark's account, but in Matthew's account, before all of this took place, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, And truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. James and John are just asking Jesus to give them the thrones closest to his. The funny thing is, Matthew records that it was actually their mother that came up first and said, Jesus, can my boys sit next to you in glory? Aww. <laughs> and then James and John just piped up. It's amazing. Now what answer does Jesus give them? Let's look at verse 38. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism which I am about to be baptized? They said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. <clears throat> the first thing we need to see is that verse 40 is further evidence that every aspect of Jesus' life, death, death, and resurrection was part of the predetermined plan of God. Even who would sit by his side was part of God's plan. God has a plan, and Jesus is sticking to that plan. And without any hesitation, he is doing the work of God on this earth, and he's not worried about anything beyond that. Now, verses 38 and 39 mention the word baptism six times. And they also mention the cup and Jesus drinking that cup twice. When we get to Mark 14, a few weeks away probably, a month or so maybe, when we get to Mark 14, we are going to hear Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on this night that he is betrayed. And in the Garden, he is going to ask God the Father, <clears throat> will you let this cup pass me by? If there is any other way, can this cup pass me? And Jesus is going to ask that three times. And in each conclusion, he's going to come to that place, no, God, your will be done. In other words, you don't have to let this cup pass you by. What is this cup that Jesus is talking about that he's going to drink? What is it? Well, in Isaiah 51, 17, the cup is spoken of as the cup of God's anger that is going to be poured out upon Israel, upon the Jew. And in Jeremiah, chapter 25, verses 15 and 17, the cup of God's wrath is spoken of. The wrath that is meant for the unbelieving nations. When Jesus is talking about the cup here, and when later he will speak of the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is referring to the cup of God's wrath that is due both Jew and Gentile alike. He is saying that he himself will drink upon himself, that the wrath of God will be poured out upon him. That he will endure God's wrath. A wrath that is not due him because he is sinless, but is due us, that he would take that cup and drink it himself. The cup of God's anger. And this baptism that Jesus speaks of, what does the word baptism mean? It means immersion. It means to be immersed in something. In Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be immersed 
in suffering he's going to be swallowed by death. And Jesus asks James and John, Are you able to be baptized into my baptism and to drink the cup that I drink? And they say, Yes, we are. But you know what we're going to see shortly as we go through this final week of Jesus' <coughs> life? It's only Jesus that ends up drinking that cup. It's only Jesus that at that time is baptized into the suffering and into death. And Jesus is just not hesitating as he walks towards that. Now Jesus does tell them that they too will drink that cup and be baptized into his baptism. So we have to ask ourselves, what's that all about? And that's kind of a difficult concept. Uh, one of, in, my, in my many years of reading the Bible, one of the verses that has disturbed me the most, or, or it's been the most difficult for me to understand, actually may help us here, understanding what Jesus is talking about. There is a verse in Colossians where Paul is writing to the church of Colossae. And you find Paul and he says these words. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul says, I suffer to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And that verse has always really disturbed me, but it, that verse helps us to understand what Paul is, I mean, what Jesus is saying to James and John here. Now, was anything lacking in the suffering of Jesus for the sake of sinful man? And the answer is no. Because on the cross, Jesus himself says, it is finished. Uh, no other work has to be done. You all don't have to be perfect to go to heaven anymore. You don't have to work your way there. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying it's finished. If they will just believe upon me, and that belief causes them to turn from their sins, it is done. They don't have to earn their way to heaven, he's saying. But then what's Paul saying about that was lacking somehow? No. Really the best understanding of this is that Paul is saying that he is suffering for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when people see him physically suffering, they are reminded of Jesus and his death and resurrection. What Paul is saying is, I am presenting in my suffering body and in my persecutions, I am presenting to the world what Jesus did for me. I, I'm reminding them of that. They, had, they didn't see Christ suffer, but they're seeing me now suffer on his behalf and is pointing people to Jesus. And that's what Jesus is telling James and John here. Jesus is telling James and John that he is going to drink the cup and that he is going to be baptized into the baptism. But at some point, because of him, they are going to suffer as well. And when they suffer, their suffering is going to point to his greater suffering. They're going to use it to point to Jesus. And we know that they died martyrs. They died martyrs after they preach the gospel. Jesus would suffer when he endured the wrath of God, and they would suffer, and it would point others to the wrath that Jesus took. And Jesus says, but to sit at my right or my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. Now, come on, Jesus is God. So couldn't he have given those places of honor? Yes, he could have. He could have said, yeah, you're over here on the right, you're over here on the left. He could have done that because he is God. But all throughout Jesus' ministry in the Gospels, we hear him say, I didn't come to do my will, I came to do the Father's will. This is all really, this whole concept of the Trinity, kind of mind-boggling. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. Jesus the Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. All three are the same God, yet even though God is equally God, God the Son will defer His will to the will of the Father, and God the Holy Spirit defers His will to God the Father and God the Son in most cases. It's just a relationship thing. 
It's like in marriage, where a wife will defer, even though she is equal with her husband, she will defer to her husband in decision makings. It's, you know, submit to her husband sort of thing. That's all that's going on here. I don't understand the Trinity fully, but it doesn't matter. It's true. What Jesus is saying is at this point, I am allowing God the Father to pick who sits by me. And I'm submitting to his will. In verse 41, this is great. I mean, picture this, you know, you just got James and John. Hey, Jesus, you know, maybe their mother. Hey, Jesus, can, can my boys sit next to you? They want the highest places of honor. And verse 41 says, hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. They got really upset at James and John for even asking this. Why? I'll tell you why. They wanted those places. I mean, they wanted those places. It's like... We're all going to go, and we're all going to go get in the cars. And whoever calls shotgun first gets up front, you know. And these, James and John had called shotgun first, and it just upset everybody else, and they didn't want to get stuck in the back seat between Aunt Gertrude and Uncle Bird. <laughs> it's the selfishness of man. They're still trying to see who the greatest is. They wanted to ride shotgun, and James and John had just called it first. That was upsetting them. Verse 42. Jesus needs to teach them again. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. You know that. I mean, isn't that true? You could turn on the TV today and you will hear something like this. Hey, I'm the boss. I'll write the executive orders myself. I have authority over you, so I will lord it over you with executive pen. Yes, I'm taking a jab at the President of the United States. Why? Because our President, more than any other right now in daily news, is demonstrating what Jesus is talking about here. Somebody that is so arrogant that they lord their authority over other people, yeah. and they don't care. Yeah. And Jesus is saying to them in verse 43, you know how all that is, but it is not to be this way among you. You're not to act like those unbelievers act. You know how unbelievers act, Jesus says. But it is not this way among you. My brothers and sisters in this room, it is not to be that way amongst us either. That we would act so boastfully and so arrogantly. That we would try to lord our authority over others. The way of our Lord Jesus Christ is not a way usurped authority. Nor is it a way of trampling down upon another's rights. Nor is it a way of aggression that we are called to walk. <coughs> it is not that way that says, hey, I'm entitled. No. The way of the Lord that the disciples were being called to walk and the way of the Lord that you and I are called to walk is a way of humility. It's a way of humbleness. It's a way of brokenness. Here, even in the midst of Jesus, once again talking about his suffering, that he's going to be spit on, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be beaten to a pulp, he's going to be crucified. Even in the midst of that, you got these guys jockeying for position. And he's saying, no, you're not supposed to be acting that way. Walk humbly in the sight of the Lord your God. Verse 43. Continues, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, there is none 
who is greater than Jesus. And there is no one who has served mankind in any way greater than Jesus. And there is none who humbled himself or has humbled herself to the extent and to the way that Jesus Christ humbled himself in order to accomplish all the good deeds that he has done. You know, James and John had asked that question, and they all really had asked that in one way or another. Who is the greatest? You know, who can sit in the highest places of honor? And Jesus is just saying, hey, huh, hey, guys, that's me. That's me. I'm serving all mankind. When we get to the thrones and we see those thrones that are being spoken of, there's going to be one throne in the center, and that's the glorious throne of Christ. And Nothing else will compare with the glorious throne of Christ. I mean, I don't care about the throne on its left or its right. You know, those are going to be trivial compared to the one who sits upon that throne in glory. The glorious throne of Christ Jesus is the center throne. The throne on the right and the left are pale in comparison, and they will never be as important. Never. Jesus is the one who has humbled himself. Jesus is the one who has become servant of all, so therefore Jesus is the greatest of all. Now Jesus does say that there are those two thrones, and he does agree that those thrones have been reserved for two others, one on his right and one on his left. Who knows, maybe it's been reserved for you. Maybe God has reserved for one in this room to sit on the left of Christ or one to sit on the right of Christ. I don't know. God alone knows. But I'll tell you this, this is what I do know. Whomever it is that will sit on the right and the left of Jesus, I know that the road that they take is going to be a very humble path. Last week we heard Jesus say that in the age to come, those who were first will be last and those who were last will be first. We heard last week that the first will be last and the last will be first, so it is clear that the ones who sit on Jesus' right and his left will more than likely be two who are considered last right now. We don't see things as God sees. God sees things as they truly are. When we get to heaven, you know, those who are the richest here will probably be paupers in heaven. And those who maybe have just been so poor here will have all the wealth of God in heaven. The two who occupy those seats will probably not hesitate in this life, in their Christian walk, as they walk to follow Jesus. Jesus laid down his will on behalf of his Father's will. And I am guaranteeing you, those who sit at the right and the left of Jesus, they, I promise you, will lay down their earthly wills for the sake of Jesus Christ and his will. We're all called to do that, to lay down our own wills for the sake of him. I mean, is that you this morning? Are you laying down your will, your desires, for the sake of Christ Jesus? Are you walking in the Christian life without hesitation as you follow Jesus? I ask myself that. Am I doing the will of God or am I doing my will? I ask myself, am I hesitating in my walk towards following Christ? I mean, he didn't hesitate on my behalf. He walked straight to that cross on my behalf. Am I somehow hesitating and holding back? We all need to ask those questions. Is, is not what he has done worth following him? Without hesitation. As we end our, our sermon this morning, we'll let that, those questions just linger in our minds. And we'll end with verse 45. For even the Son of Man, so Jesus is saying, even I did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom. Even the greatest who ever lived and who ever walked this earth, Jesus Christ, he came to serve. He did not come to be served. 
He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Why is Jesus not hesitating as he marches his way towards Jerusalem, as he, as he almost runs towards his death? Why is he not hesitating? It's because Jesus knows that his death is going to be the ransom for them. And that through his blood, he will buy back many from the slavery of death, from the slavery of sin, from the hands of Satan. He is going to spare men from the wrath of God that is coming. And Jesus knows that. And eagerly he runs towards the cross that he may become that ransom. A ransom is a price paid to buy the release of one who is being held in captivity. And the death of Jesus Christ paid the price to buy many out of the captivity of sin, death, and God's wrath. Now Jesus doesn't say that I give my life for the ransom of everyone. He doesn't say that. He says for the ransom of many. Jesus died for those who will repent and believe upon him in faith. If you believe Jesus is Lord and that your, your own righteousness is like filthy rags, if you believe that you need a righteousness outside of yourself, that your own good works cannot save you, if you believe that, and if you turn to Jesus Christ, believing that it is his righteousness, his death on the cross, his work of salvation, if that is what you need, and if you see that and you say, I need his death applied to my life, his righteousness applied to my life, because my sins can't, are, cannot be overcome by any of my good works, if you believe that enough to turn from your sin, if you, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ alone, and you turn from your sins out of gratitude towards all that he has done, to pay your ransom, then you are part of that many. Be assured, be happy, rejoice, be glad. Because that means that as he was not hesitating, as he marched towards the cross, he was doing so on your behalf, because you are part of the many. That's good news. There are some in here, though, as we end, that, that may never have placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone to be saved from the wrath of God to come. There are some in here that are probably even thinking, you know what, I'm going to earn my way to heaven by doing good works and good deeds. There are some that think, I just have to be a good person to get to heaven. I just have to do this or to do that. You know, if you are one of those people this morning, then you are not part of the many. You have not yet been ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. But there is still time. There is still time, though. That is the good news. There is still time as long as you have breath in your lungs and the ability to think. There is time for you to hesitate no longer. For you to place your faith in Christ alone for salvation. For you to ask for God's forgiveness that you might be saved. As we end this morning, that's my, my urging to everyone here. Do not hesitate any longer. Scripture tells us today is the day of salvation. Let us not harden our hearts. If even this morning you have heard the Holy Spirit prompt you inside your heart saying, just surrender all to Jesus. Just ask Him for forgiveness and He will forgive you. If you have heard these things, stop trusting in your good works. Put your faith in Jesus. If you have heard those things, then hesitate no longer. Because today is the day of salvation. And in that way, you can leave your part of that many. So that's why Jesus was running urgently, heading towards Jerusalem. Even knowing all that was coming was to save. To save those who put their faith and trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that Jesus Christ was willing to become the sacrificial lamb, that he was willing to take your wrath. We thank you, Father, that your son, Jesus, was willing to take your wrath against him so that that wrath would not have to be poured out upon us. And Father,
Father, we ask that each and every person in here would not hesitate any longer, that would truly lay aside all thoughts that our goodness is going to get us to heaven, that we would all lay aside any hope that we can be a good enough person to get to heaven, and that we would all just put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and believe that he truly was the ransom that saved us. And, and Lord, as we look upon your cross this morning, let us, every one of us, do it in gratitude, knowing that we have the opportunity to repent and believe and to follow you, and that you will receive all who come to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Father, as we close this service today, we pray once again for those who are physically injured right now, Lord, who physically need a healing as well. We pray for those who are depressed right now, Lord. We pray for those who, who just need to be touched by you in whatever way it may be. We ask that as every one of us goes out of here today, we would do so to the glory of Jesus Christ. And we pray and we thank you for this service in the name of Jesus. Amen.